as co-director of special ed at the University of Colorado. Didn't last, but 
They didn't like me, but I stayed anyway. They couldn't get rid of me. Um, so I did, during that time, start the very first Boulder Association for Gifted and Talented in the 70s. And uh, it, it died a sad death, but it was resurrected by all these wonderful people. So how many of you are gifted? Oh, don't all raise your hands at once. Okay. How many of you have gifted children? Aha. Uh -huh. There's more people who have gifted children than who are gifted. Hmm. Did you all adopt? <laughs> Were they delivered by the stork? So if you have gifted children but you aren't, uh, how does that work? How do you account for that? Did you create a gifted child like a yuppie pasta? So where there was no genetic anything, you just knew how to make a gifted child from scratch. If, if that's what you think, then maybe you should sell it because I'm sure you could make a fortune. How many of you used to be gifted? I hear that having children kind of takes that away because you can't even put two sentences together without being interrupted. And Anyway, um, I am going to convince many of you who are skeptical, who were dragged here by your significant other, that you really aren't in the wrong presentation. If you're average, is everybody else stupid? Because those are your choices. You can either be gifted and have compassion on your coworkers who are not, whose minds don't work like yours, or you can insist that you're not gifted, you're just average and the whole world is stupid. Um, here is a test for those of you who are still non-believers. Has anyone ever said any of these to you at any time in your life? Why do you make everything so complicated? Why do you take everything so seriously? Why is everything so important to you? I'm seeing knowing looks and glances, some of them in the direction of the person you're sitting with. Um, so if you, if you really still don't believe that this is true, ask the person you live with. They will tell you. So the gifted are to everything. Too sensitive, too intense, too driven, too honest, too idealistic, too moral, too perfectionistic, and too much for other people. My friend, Patty Gatto Walden, who's been a psychologist of the gifted for many, many decades, calls these the terrible twos. <laughs> Next time someone calls you too sensitive, who, who in this room has been called too sensitive? Well, I've got news for you. This is hot off the press, and it was given to me by Jacob, my uh, wonderful office manager. It had come in the mail this week, and it's called Sensitive. So is it the right amount of sensitivity to be able to eat your dinner and digest while you're watching the war in Ukraine? Is that how much sensitivity you're supposed to have? So anybody who can't digest while they're watching a war is too sensitive? Is that how it works? Maybe the next time someone calls you too sensitive, you say, maybe you're not sensitive enough. So I want to I read you some quotes because I love this book and I've just started reading it. In fact, a better word for sensitive might be responsive. If you are a sensitive person, your body and mind respond more to the world around you. You respond more to heartbreak, pain, and loss, but you also respond more to beauty, new ideas, and joy. You go deep where others only skim the surface. You keep thinking when others have given up and moved on to something else. Here's another one. The sensitive way is the belief deep down that quality of life is more valuable than raw achievement, that human connection is more satisfying than dominating others, and that your life is more meaningful when you spend time reflecting on your experiences 
and leading with your heart. So with a name like this, you won't have to, you don't need to know who the authors are, but it's Jen Graneman and Andre Solo. All right. How many here are still not convinced? I have done my best, but you're, you're going to hold on to I'm not gifted. Give me your excuse. I'm not gifted because. I still make mistakes. Oh, never put this person into a gifted program because people in gifted programs never, ever make mistakes. What, 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 what else have you got going? Yes. You're slow. And all gifted people are fast, except those who aren't, who are more reflective. Okay, what else have we got here? Yes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of goes with the territory. <laughs> you, can't, you can't avoid that. It's, a, it's one of those problems that we run into as parents of the gifted. So I want to share with you what a group of teachers said in response to I'm not gifted because. But I have to tell you how all of this started. I was invited to keynote a conference on gifted women. It was probably the very first conference on gifted women, and it was at the University of Washington. And I walked into the room, I had really prepared, and I saw the looks on everybody's faces, and I said, okay, they all think they're at the wrong conference. So I threw out everything that I had written, and I wrote up, I'm not gifted because, and then they just started to spill all their reasons for being for believing that they're not gifted this is these are the the ones the top faves of a group of teachers i have a terrible memory i couldn't concentrate during lectures i wasn't an a student i was a troublemaker i didn't do well on my sats i didn't enjoy reading i could never do math i'm just an overachiever any of that sound familiar? Okay, how many of you consider yourselves overachievers? Oh, Jen, explain yourself. How are you an overachiever? I'm an overachiever because, yeah. Right, if you're gifted, if you're smart, you don't have to work hard. Tell that to Rachmaninoff or Marie Curie. They never had to work hard, right? Uh, okay, what else? You're an overachiever, who else? What's your excuse? Um, I think I told that I just keep on achieving them, and that's tick, tick, and that was just ticking. Okay, I'm having trouble hearing you. Sorry. Um, I'm just an overachiever because I set goals, and then I achieve them. And that's what I thought you said. I was afraid that's what you said. <laughs> okay, if you achieve goals, then you couldn't possibly be an achiever. You have to be an overachiever. Who else has, who else can I make fun of tonight? <laughs> Anybody? Oh, you're not brave enough. Okay, so. Um, what exactly is an overachiever? I gave this to this question to another group of teachers in Texas, and I'd love to share the answers with you because they're so informative. They said, someone who thinks that second place is the first loser, someone who doesn't know the word no, someone who sets a goal and not only achieves but goes beyond, Someone who compensates for weaknesses by putting in hours above and beyond. Now, this is one of my very favorites. Someone who sets unrealistic goals and then meets them. What's wrong with that picture? Someone who puts work above relationships. Someone who chooses not to delegate. 
someone who gets ulcers worrying about insignificant details, someone who is trying to achieve someone else's goals, someone who has to be absolutely perfect, <laughs> someone who is not satisfied unless he or she gets an A, someone who goes beyond the requirements, someone who always makes extra work for him or herself. But this is my absolute favorite. Someone who exceeds his or her potential. <laughs> and how exactly do you do that? <laughs> so at Gifted Development Center, we give achievement tests along with IQ tests. If a child achieves higher than they got on an IQ test, the score on the IQ test, the IQ score must be an underestimate. I tell parents, use the score on the achievement test as the best estimate of your child's abilities because you can't achieve more than your potential. It doesn't make any logical sense. All right. Have you ever studied for a test? Really, really studied hard. And you knew you should have aced that test, but you didn't because the instructor asked a bunch of questions you were not studying nor prepared to answer. Did that ever happen to anybody in this room? Okay. So was that performance the best indication of your capability? No. Because any time you take any test, an IQ test, an SAT test, an achievement test, a class test, it's only like a slice of information that you're being tested on at that particular moment in time. There is no test on the face of the earth that could be created that can test everything that you're competent in. So your competence is always greater than your performance. If this is true, how many of you think I'm right about this? Your competence is always greater than your performance. How is it possible to be an overachiever? It isn't. Get rid of it. Cut it out. Don't tell yourself you're an overachiever. Don't tell your children they're overachievers. Don't tell your spouse he or she is an overachiever. Get rid of the term altogether. I've found that it is used more often against females than it is against males. Because if a woman or a young girl works hard, then she's compensating for the fact that she's really not smart. She's not smart enough to do it on the basis, to get good grades on the basis of her ability. It's only through hard work. No, it doesn't work that way. So this is a term I would like all of you to just omit from your vocabulary. Don't think about it that way. It doesn't make sense. So what exactly is giftedness? Uh, I'm going to give you a test. Pick the best answer. High achievement, the potential for eminence, a strong work ethic and motivation, a success mindset, exceptional abstract reasoning ability. Okay, how many for A? No takers. B, the potential for eminence. Okay, we've got a few here. You've been brainwashed by academia, I can tell. A strong work ethic and motivation. How many think it's that? No. How about a success mindset? Well, I think everybody should have a success mindset. I don't think it's a gifted thing. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think it has anything to do with gifted. My vote is for E. I believe that giftedness is essentially exceptional abstract reasoning ability. You see it in two-year-olds and you see it in 92-year-olds. It crosses all spectrum of society. It doesn't matter if you have disabilities. It doesn't matter if you work hard or you don't work hard. If you're an achiever or not an achiever. 
that abstract reasoning ability you came in with. But not everybody agrees with me. And there's been a, a huge number of people, especially in academia, who have totally believed that the purpose of gifted education is to create eminent people. And that's what giftedness is all about, the potential for eminence. I have a problem with that. It's problematic to have been identified for a gifted program as a child and then learn that you can only be a gifted adult if you're eminent. If you're not eminent, does that mean you were never gifted in the first place? This is the only field that has two completely different views of what a, a particular syndrome is in childhood and in adulthood. I look at gifted as a part of special education. If you take a look at something like dyslexia, if you were to talk with children who are dyslexic or adults who are dyslexic, you pretty much are looking at the same definition. Only in gifted land is eminence even an issue for adults. And it really is misleading because eminence is not something we can all attain. I look at giftedness as a psychological reality. And it has lifelong ramifications. Giftedness creates qualitatively different life experiences. If giftedness were understood as an organizing principle, it would be apparent a person does not outgrow giftedness no more than anyone outgrows significant intellectual disability. The issues faced by this group in childhood simply morph into new variations in adulthood. Few people really get it. Few grasp the fundamental experience of giftedness, the outsider status in a society suspicious of outsiders. That's the real thing. So let's talk about the gift itself. It starts with having a very unusual mind. How many of you have minds that never stop? It just goes all the time. My husband used to say to me, don't you get tired of thinking? As if I had a choice about it. So if you've got this unusual mind, you also feel out of sync with other people who don't have the same unusual mind that doesn't turn off. And it also leads you to believe the omnipotent fantasy that everything in the world depends on you. And so you have to make a list from the moment you get up in the morning and check it off every night to make sure you're doing your job to keep the planet going because it all depends on you. I've been making lists since I was 11 years old. How many of you are list makers? Now, this is something we don't hear a whole lot about, but I would like us to understand that one of the facets of giftedness is having a creative mind that mercilessly generates new ideas all the time and expects you to get that list out and write down all those things that your mind would like you to be doing. Sometimes those ideas come at the strangest times, like in the middle of making love, wait, I gotta write this down. And they say to ask a busy person to do something because a busy person is the person who's most likely to be able to find the time to do any additional task. How many of you wear many hats? Lots of different responsibilities. And then, how many of you set standards that are higher than everybody else you know? And you work overtime to try to meet those standards. And people call you 
perfectionistic or crazy. But these are all part and parcel of the gifted experience. Impossible dreams are realized, unrealistic goals achieved, insurmountable obstacles surmounted by people whose vision is a more powerful reality than the limitations that most of the world accepts as real. So yeah, you may be Don Quixote here, but there's a reason why all of this has been given to you. You are intense, complex, sensitive, perfectionistic, idealistic, mission-driven, indignant about injustices that no one else notices. These are gifted problems. Whenever anybody questions why you're like that, you just say, it's because I'm gifted. That's the way it is. So let's talk more about what these characteristics are. How many of you have heard the term asynchrony? Asynchronous development. Barb Hutton is here. She's part of the asynchrony, uh, what should we call ourselves? Cult. Cult, oh, that's good. <laughs> she helped to create the, the definition of giftedness as asynchronous development. And it means being out of sync, being more intense, being more complex, and having all these overexcitabilities. Perceptive. How many of you as children remember knowing things that you shouldn't have known? There was no such thing as behind closed doors because you always figured out what was going on in your house. Complexity. Complexity comes with the territory of giftedness. So does perfectionism. This is not a disease. This is not something you need to cure. There's positive and negative aspects of it, but every gifted person I have ever met is perfectionistic in something. It could be how you put your baseball cards together, or the pen that you use to write your checks with, or the order in which you eat your M&Ms. But perfectionism, if you look for it, you'll find it. Idealistic. That idealism comes with the territory. How many of you have heard of overexcitability? We're going to be talking more about that. Intensity, sensitivity, need for meaning, moral concern, divergent thinking, questioning authority, which has always gotten me in trouble, argumentativeness. Now, I've only come across two types of gifted people when it comes to argumentativeness. There are those who tell you to your face that they disagree with what you're saying, and then there are the polite ones that are arguing with you in their heads, but you don't know what they're saying because you can't hear their heads. And some of you who think you have children that don't argue, uh, think again. <laughs> Ask your children what they're thinking. Responsibility, aesthetic sense, possibly introverted, not necessarily, uh, but the higher the IQ, the more likely an individual is to be introverted, and sense of humor. Lita Hollingworth, who started this field, said that sense of humor was the saving grace of the gifted. But a few weeks ago, I had the most wonderful message given to me in the wee hours of the morning as I was waking up. I hated being teased as a kid. How many of you hated being teased? <clears throat> well, think about this. They can't laugh at you when you're laughing with them. How about that? They can't laugh at you if you're laughing too. So these characteristics are lifelong and they differentiate the experience of gifted individuals from birth to maturity. Cognitive complexity gives rise to emotional depth and sensitivity. Thus, the gifted not only think differently from their peers, they also feel differently. See if you relate to anything 
on this page. Anything worth feeling is worth feeling intensely. Nothing is simple, bland, or colorless. Everything is electrically charged with rich, multicolored layers of meaning. Welcome to Living Opera. That's your family. That's why you don't have a peaceful household, because you're all gifted. So overexcitability is an English translation of a Polish term that the real meaning is super stimulatability. It means a nervous system that is wired for greater responsiveness than the norm. This is one of my favorite quotes. Cognitive complexity, emotional sensitivity, heightened imagination, and magnified sensations, those are all overexcitabilities, combined to create what Michael Piafsi says, a different quality of experiencing, vivid, absorbing, penetrating, encompassing, complex, commanding, a way of being quiveringly alive. So the idea of overexcitabilities came from Kazimir Dombrowski. And we have Catherine Zakoyan with us, who's she's run parent groups in Boulder on Dombrowski's theory. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about these overexcitabilities. He identified five channels of heightened experience or overexcitabilities, psychomotor, sensual, imaginational, intellectual, and emotional. So what exactly is overexcitability? It's a greater innate capacity to respond to stimuli. For example, born that way. And Michael Piafsky, who worked very closely with Dabrowski and brought overexcitabilities to us in Gifted Land, he says OE also stands for original equipment. Overexcitabilities. The overexcitabilities can you be thought. I beg your pardon, I wasn't talking to you. <clears throat> My watch. Okay. Goodbye. The overexcitabilities can be thought of as an abundance of physical, sensual, creative, intellectual, and emotional energy, which cause inner turmoil to be sure but they also result in creative endeavors as well as advanced emotional and ethical development in adulthood. So it's not, if you don't like the term over because overexcitable sounds like there's something wrong with you, think about it this way. Imagine having too much money or too much health. So over doesn't necessarily have to be bad. So I'm going to go over each of these areas, each of these factors, and I want you to think which ones you relate to. Are you overexcitable? Which characteristics fit you as a child? Which ones fit you now? Which bring you joy? And which characteristics bring you pain? So here's psychomotor overexcitability. Rapid speech, marked excitation, intense physical activity, pressure for action. You're the one at the board meeting that says, okay, we've talked about this long enough, now what are we gonna do about it? Pressure for action. Competitiveness or enjoying competitive sports, compulsive talking. I should be wearing a t-shirt that says I'm talking and I can't stop. Nervous habits, workaholism. Any workaholics in here? <laughs> okay, so that's psychomotor OE. Now here's sensual OE, my personal favorite. Enhanced sensory pleasure. Seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, hearing. Linus in his blanket. Delight in beautiful objects, sounds of words, music, form, color, and balance. Overeating. Buying sprees. Wanting to be in the limelight. So here are some of my favorite sensual experiences top of which is bubble baths. I'm the bubble bath queen. I believe that there's not much in life that a bubble bath can't fix. So how many of you love chocolate cake? Raise your hand. Now, how many of you adore dark chocolate, 
to the point where it's a spiritual experience. That's the difference between overexcitability and excitability. Well, everybody likes chocolate cake. Well, not everybody, but most everybody. But this is something altogether different. Imaginational overexcitability, free play of the imagination, frequent use of image and metaphor, facility with fantasy, imaginary companions, mixing truth and fiction. We had one kid who came home and said, Mom, I can't stand what the teacher is doing to Jenny. And would go every day, there'd be something new, until the parent went to the school and said, I need to talk to you about your behavior toward Jenny. And the teacher said, who's Jenny? I have a Jenny. Low tolerance for boredom, need for novelty and variety, Gary Larson. Here he is wanting cookies, that's his sensual overexcitability, but in his imagination, to get to the cookies, he has to pass the crocodiles. Who's going to win, the sensual or the imaginational? And then intellectual overexcitability is the one we associate the most with giftedness. Avid reading, probing questions, keen observation, detailed visual recall, independence of thought, sometimes very critical, preoccupation with logic, thinking about thinking, love of theory and analysis. How many of you love hearing about a new theory? Intellectual overexcitability, that's you. Okay. So, were you the kid that said why all the time until your parents wanted to bop you one? And we at one time, when we first learned about Dabrowski's theory, when I was teaching at the University of Denver, we called it Dabrowski's theory of emotional development because the focus of the theory was on emotional overexcitability. And that includes intensified complex feelings and emotions, strong somatic expressions like tense stomach, blushing, sweaty palms, powerful emotional expressions, enthusiasm, ecstasy, affective memory, anxiety, guilt, depressive and suicidal moods, capacity for deep attachment and relationships, difficulty adjusting to newness, compassion and empathy. So a lot of question has gone on since overexcitability has got to be so popular. How can we distinguish overexcitability from ADHD, from sensory processing disorder, from other issues? Well, we at Gifted Development Center give an overexcitability questionnaire to all parents who bring their kids in for testing and a behavioral checklist, which has the characteristics or symptoms of uh, ADHD. And we give a short sensory profile that looks at what the symptoms are for sensory processing disorder. So we're able to separate those threads. We don't have to wonder. We have the data to actually look at it. But there is an easier way. If you want to use the term overexcitability to describe yourself or your family, look for the positive descriptors. Did you notice that the vast majority of those descriptors were in yellow? Those were the positive ones. You, if your child cries at a sunset and you want to call that overexcitability, be my guest. No question, no problem. But if you see a negative aspect, it's really essential to rule out other causes of overlapping symptoms. If you feel like, I don't want to be here anymore, the world doesn't need me, I just am going to kill myself, somebody telling you that's emotional overexcitability is not very helpful. You actually need to see somebody who's going to help, like Catherine Zakoyan. Whether you were identified as gifted as a child or you were missed, you need to own your own giftedness as an adult. 
Giftedness is a part of your identity. You cannot fully understand yourself or others without embracing your giftedness. And if that isn't good enough reason, do it for your kids. Because you cannot expect your children to appreciate their giftedness if you're not going to appreciate yours. Every gift contains a danger. Whatever gift we have, we are compelled to express. And if the expression of that gift is blocked, distorted, or merely allowed to languish, then the gift turns against us and we suffer. Many gifted adults, I call them the walking wounded, feel estranged and lonely, not realizing it is their own giftedness that's at the heart of this experience. Many feel that there's something wrong with them and it's not fixable. And many feel like imposters waiting to be unmasked. The gifted struggle constantly between integrity and accommodation, viewing all of life as a complex set of ethical dilemmas. But here's the good news. You have all these qualities and all these abilities for a reason. They can lead to a life vision, creating a sense of purpose larger than self, the ultimate outcome of a gifted life. That is a quote from our friend Rosemary Cathcart in New Zealand. Many years ago, I was asked by Sing, that's Supporting Emotional Needs of the Gifted, to write 100 words of advice for gifted adults. And this is what I wrote. Giftedness is not what you do or how hard you work. It's who you are. You think differently. You experience life intensely. You care about injustice. You seek meaning. You appreciate and strive for the exquisite. You are painfully sensitive. You are extremely complex. You cherish integrity. Your truth telling has gotten you in trouble. Should 98% of the population find you odd, seek the company of those who love you just the way you are. You are not broken. You do not need to be fixed. You are utterly fascinating. You are a gift to the world. You are needed. There are times when the world is just so oppressive that you feel, I don't know if I can stand it, but you can. Keep standing it because you really are needed. Your gifts are needed in the world. Never forget that. Thank you.